Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here and a great pleasure to see so many people here and so many people that are here to listen a little bit about security. So uh, Talos is Cisco's security research and threat intelligence organization. And what our role is, is really to think about the threat environment, to follow the changes that are out there, and make sure that we've got that security technology that allows people to deploy all of these wonderful applications and possibilities that we've heard about over these past couple of days. For me, what we're seeing is Moore's Law in action. Gordon Moore, one of the founders of Intel, came up in the late 60s with the rule that uh, the density of transistors on chips is going to double every 18 to 24 months. What that means is that computers and computing devices are getting smaller and smaller. They're getting more and more powerful in terms of the computation that they can do. They're getting less and less powerful in terms of the power and the electricity that they pull. But most importantly, they're getting cheaper and cheaper, which means that standalone computer devices that can connect to the, uh, to the internet and network and run an operating system that in the recent past would have cost hundreds of dollars, now cost just a few dollars. And in the near future, they're going to cost tens of cents. At that point, and about now, we can envisage having these small computer devices just about everywhere, doing things that we've heard about over these past couple of days. I think one of the key things that these systems are going to do is collect data, information about the environment, information about how we use other devices, uh, information about where uh, devices or systems are physically located, opening up new opportunities for the way that we live our lives and conduct our, our, our work life. So this data that these devices are going to collect is going to be valuable. It's going to be valuable in some way. It's going to be something that we can use to make new opportunities for our lives. If there's one thing I've learned in working in security, it's if something is valuable, then someone will try and steal it. Something's going to happen with this data, for sure. Someone is very now, at this very moment, thinking about how they can make illicit gain from all of these wonderful devices that we're imagining today. So let's have a think. Come up with a hypothetical Internet of Things architecture and imagine how could we subvert this for criminal gain. So the type of application that you might be thinking about at the moment, we've got a, a cloud, a network of many different sensors which are collecting some kind of data about the environment or about our work, sending that over to a, a buzzword compliant cloud hosted big data system running artificial intelligence, which is going to make sense of this data, understand it, come up with some kind of decisions about what we need to do and issue instructions to some kind of actuators that are going to change the environment or react in some way or notify someone. So first, let's consider these sensors and imagine the internet of compromised things. Because as Moore's Law has brought all of these new devices and this new capacity to computing devices, the science of software engineering has unfortunately not quite kept up. The upshot of this is, is the number of vulnerabilities that have been discovered that can be used to subvert systems. We've got the same number that were discovered last year compared with 10 years ago in 2006. This has not kept up with Moore's law. On the positive side, We've got a lot more software that's out there that's in deployment. Also, we've got an awful lot more people that are looking for these vulnerabilities and are describing them and are, and are publicizing them and getting them fixed when they're found. So in many ways, the fact that that number hasn't changed too much is, is good news. The other good news is in 2006, roughly one in three of these vulnerabilities were trivial to exploit. The good news is, that's now dropped to only one in five. The bad news? 
One in five vulnerabilities are trivial to, ex to execute and to exploit for a bad guy. This is not really a good situation to be in. What this ultimately means is that anywhere that you've got software running, you're going to have vulnerabilities. What this means in practice is these weird and wonderful IoT devices that we're, de that we're deploying, they're running software, they are going to have vulnerabilities. The people that worry about keeping environments entirely secure and free of bugs now have to worry about the heating and cooling systems because they're potentially vulnerable. Uh, when we at Talos have looked at IoT devices such as this thermostat, we've been able to find that it's got a, um, a, a, a buffer overflow vulnerability where the data which is coming into it isn't properly sanitized, which allows you to execute commands on that device and make it do whatever you want it to do. Once we've managed to do that, we've taken control of this device, we can then analyze it further and find that there's actually hard-coded credentials in there, usernames and passwords that once you learn, you can actually use to log in to any of these devices that's not patched anywhere in the world. Bad guys, they're aware of this. They're well aware of it. And we get the development of malware such as the Mirai botnet that nine months ago launched the largest denial of service attack that we've ever seen. The way that this was constructed and was built was through the bad guys knowing these default credentials that you can use to log into systems that are either hard-coded or that nobody's changed that default password. Once you've managed to log into these systems, you can upload your own software. It's just a computing device. Our bad guys know how to make money from this. They've been building botnets for years. An IoT device is just a networked computer device. We can use it for the same illicit gain as any other computer. We can use it to launch denial of service attacks, uh, launch old-fashioned uh, uh, exhaustion attacks against small businesses or big businesses and network systems. We can use it to send spam. Still a very profitable activity. We can also use it as a point of ingress into a wider network and use that as a system to go out and find other potentially more interesting systems where there's more valuable stuff that can be stolen. We know how to protect ourselves against this kind of problem. Um, but security in the IoT isn't going to improve until it becomes a key part of the procurement process. And the people that are specifying IoT systems and buying them and making that decision also based on security. How secure is this system? How is the software developed? How are you finding vulnerabilities? Because they're going to exist. And when you find them, how do you patch it? How do you patch your thermostat? When was the last time you patched your hot water system? I don't know. And equally, we need to think about authentication. Usernames and passwords is not a good way of authenticating access to systems. It's never really worked. There are better ways. Let's also think about this data that the sensors are sending back. We can imagine an internet of fake things where this data is uh, altered and played with, and we have bad data going into our decision system, which is coming up with bad decisions. The Internet of Things opens up a whole new class of attacks called Sybil attacks, named after a, uh, a book describing a multiple personality disorder, where we can have a legitimate sensor diligently reporting a particular problem, potentially a high temperature situation, and saying, hey, it's hot here, it's hot here. But that voice is drowned by a chorus of fake sensors that are sending in fake data saying, no, it's cold in here, mate. Oh, bruh. no, cold, under temperature, under temperature. Our decision system is trying to make the best out of this conflicting information and comes up quite logically with the idea that, well, the consensus is that it's actually cold in here. Maybe we should turn the heating up and send out that as an instruction. Entirely the wrong thing to do because that true value, that true information is drowned in a chorus of fake data. We've heard a lot over the past couple of days about autonomous vehicles. What a superb idea. 
I'd really, really love to be able to uh, drive somewhere and just relax and let the car do it. Did you know that the traffic alerts that you get in your car at the moment are entirely unauthenticated? If you have the right radio transmitter and know a little bit about the protocol, you can create your own fake traffic alerts. Isn't that wonderful? Even more interestingly, you can create fake traffic jams. Those devices you have in your car, when you look in, you're driving around, and you want to know where the traffic jams are. It's phoning home data about saying, well, I'm at Junction 11 on the M25, and I'm going really slowly. And another car saying, oh, I'm coming up to Junction 11, and I'm in stationary traffic. If you create fake information saying that, you can create a fake traffic jam. The system comes to the conclusion there's a traffic jam here. What does it do with the people who are relying on this data? They reroute the traffic. They decide to take another route, perfectly sensible, which leaves the actual road open and unencumbered and free of traffic for the guy who's created the fake traffic jam. Wonderful. Superb way of subverting these wonderful autonomous cars, if you haven't thought about the, uh, the system before. We know how to protect against this. Again, this is an issue of authenticating connections and ensuring the integrity of that data in transit. It's also a question of empowering people to do what people do best, which is use their curiosity, use their ingenuity to look at what's happening, look at what's being told to these decision systems, and spot what's going wrong, spot the unusual, and follow that trail, work out what's happening, and get it fixed. It's not magic, we know how to do it, but we have to think about it in advance, and we have to make it happen. Unless you've been living under a rock for the last 10 days, you will have heard of ransomware. Um, it's a massive problem. It's a new way for the bad guys to make money from systems that otherwise they couldn't necessarily monetize. We've seen, uh, very recently, the spread of WannaCry, which has hit a whole wealth of Internet of Things devices and disrupted a whole range of systems. Interestingly, this is not the first destructive worm. Those of you with very long memories might remember the Morris worm from 1988. Those of you of a certain age might have received an email in May 2000, I love you, which then mailed itself out to all of your contacts. Those of you who've been in the industry for a while during the year 2000s would have remember Conficker, Code Red, other worms that have spread across the internet and caused all sorts of havoc. Worms happen. WannaCry is not the first. It will also not be the last. What is different about WannaCry is it's the first worm that's included ransomware as well and encrypted files and caused havoc that way. Also, interestingly, uh, it includes code that was stolen from the NSA with their uh, exploits to get into systems and turned that into a worm. We know the vulnerability that these exploits are exploiting. It was patched by Microsoft on March the 14th. Uh, we also created signatures to detect the exploitation uh, of this particular vulnerability, released it in March, released additional uh, protection in April. So if you were patching, if you had wrapped up your systems in uh, network security, you were protected. If you didn't, you were almost certainly hit by this worm, scanning both your internal networks, looking for other vulnerable devices and also scanning the internet and looking to spread that way. This is not the first worm that has, ha that has hit the internet. It will not be the last. So we need to prepare for this. We know how to protect systems. One of the key things is to realize what is important in your own systems. Ask yourself, what could possibly go wrong and protect those systems appropriately? Patching. Very, very effective, a very, very effective way of stopping these kind of worms. Understand, you can't always patch every system. In which case, you can wrap it up in extra layers of security and stop the threats coming into these systems. It is not impossible to protect yourselves. 
And the big Achilles heel of ransomware are backups. If all your files get encrypted and ransomed, if you've got a backup, you can restore. Hey, presto, you can keep going. Think about that. Think about, are your backups actually real? Can you really restore from them? And equally, if some kind of Internet of Thing device, a sensor or an actuator, was to be hit by ransomware, how would you actually back that up? Have you tried that? Have you tested it? Just think about these instructions. The Internet of False Instructions. We have a superb case study from a few years ago, the Marucci Shire incident. Uh, Marucci Shire is uh, a township in Queensland, in Australia. Had the wonderful idea, an early adopter of the Internet of Things, uh, deployed a wireless system to control the pumping of their waste water. Superb idea, very effective. One of the individuals who helped deploy that system was subsequently refused a full-time job, took that badly, used his knowledge of this waste water system to drive around the township in his car with his laptop, remotely activating all the pumps, flooded the township with 800,000 litres of raw sewage. If you read the report, it describes the creek turned black, all the fish died, and the stench was unbearable. So we need to think about instructions, fake instructions. How are we going to detect those? How can we authenticate connections? Going back to authentication again, make sure these connections are actually what we're expecting and are genuine, ensuring the integrity of that data in transit, and again, empower people to be able to verify what's happening, verify the outcomes, verify that when you send an instruction, that valve has actually opened, and if that valve has opened, this was actually something that you commanded and something that you wanted to happen. Because sometimes the unexpected really, really can hit you. And that unexpected can be very, very unexpected indeed. Who would imagine that a sloth could switch off the gas pipeline in Peru? This is very, very unexpected indeed. Probably wasn't written in the risk register when this was commissioned. But nevertheless, it does happen. And we need to empower our people, empower humans to do what humans do best, which is identify when the unexpected is happening and being able to fix that and resolve the situation. Talos, as I said briefly, we're Cisco's Security Research and Threat Intelligence Organization. Our role, understand the threat landscape, understand what's happening, understand what the attacks are, understand what the vulnerabilities are, and develop the detection logic and the detection engines which underpin Cisco's security products and security offering so that we can enable people to adopt the Internet of Things and deploy all these weird and wonderful uh, solutions and ideas that we've heard about, but do that securely and do that safely. So with that, I'd encourage you to read our blog where we publish our research. I'd also strongly encourage you to follow our Twitter feed and keep up with the types of things that we're talking about. And with that, I shall thank you very, very much indeed for listening. Thank you. <laughs>